Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And in our ongoing series on Nobel Prize winners, tonight we're going to talk about J. Robert Schrieffer, who died recently at the age of 88. Dr. Schrieffer was awarded one-third of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1972, along with John Bardeen and Leon N. Cooper. Their prize motivation was their jointly developed theory of superconductivity, usually called the BCS theory. The name BCS theory comes from the last name's initials of the three theorists, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer. According to NobelPrize.org, when certain metals are cooled to extremely low temperatures, they become superconductors, conducting electrical current entirely without resistance. Based on quantum mechanics, Robert Schrieffer, Leon Cooper, and John Bardeen formulated a theory for the phenomenon in 1957. At extremely low temperatures, the interactions between electrons and atoms in the metal's crystalline structure causes the electrons to pair up with one another. As a result, their movement becomes orderly, unlike the random movement at normal temperatures, and electrical resistance disappears. Well, here we are in physics again. As you know, that's not my metier, but I'll try and bumble my way through. Anyway, Robert Schrieffer came from Oak Park, Illinois, not too far from here, but he moved down to Florida when he was a kid. He did his graduate work at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign under Professor John Bardeen. And actually, John Bardeen is a quite interesting guy because he was awarded two Nobel Prizes, one of the only people to be awarded two Nobel Prizes in the same field. In 1956, he was awarded part of the Nobel Prize along with William Shockley for the development of the transistor. He said that was pretty much a gadget-related thing, and the Nobel Prize he was awarded in 1972 with Cooper and Schrieffer was the one that really spoke more to scientific theory, and in that respect, he was much more proud of that one. Here's the University of Illinois website on Bardeen and Schrieffer and the 1972 Nobel Prize. The theory of superconductivity was known as the BCS theory for Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer. Bardeen shared the Nobel with two students who worked on it with him. Leon Cooper came from New York and was Bardeen's postdoctoral student. J. Robert Schrieffer was Bardeen's graduate student who elected superconductivity as his thesis topic. Both men recall the time and the campus as friendly and collegial. Their work with Bardeen, they said, was family style. Both credited Bardeen with providing fatherly guidance. Well, I'll try and bumble my way through what Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer did. Superconductors are materials that conduct electricity with virtually no resistance. Your classical conductors like copper overheat when too much current is passed through them. Materials that don't exhibit resistance and don't overheat are extremely valuable in the magnets of most modern magnetic resonance imaging machines and for accelerating protons at the particle accelerators that study the smallest bits of the universe. A lot of our physics Nobel Prize winners have worked at particle accelerator labs which are dependent on superconductors. The concept of superconductivity was discovered more than a hundred years ago when a Dutch physicist first observed in 1911 that mercury that had been cooled to below minus 452 degrees Fahrenheit, about seven degrees above absolute zero, would not show any resistance. It was essentially the first superconductor and it stunned the scientific community. A whole lot of physics and practical effects changed if you could pass electricity through a superconductor. And many of the greatest scientists of the 20th century set out to figure out how that happened. So you had Einstein, Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, Wolfgang Pauli, Richard Feynman, all trying to find an explanation for superconductivity, and none of them could. Who ultimately figured it out? Bardeen and his two students at Urbana-Champaign. Within a couple of years in the 1950s, they had solved pieces of the problem including how electrons, which normally repel one another, could be mutually attracted and pair up. This was an essential prerequisite for understanding the collective behavior of electrons within superconductors. Schrieffer arrived at the final piece in 1957 when he was at a physics conference in New York City. While he was riding the subway, he came up with a mathematical expression that described how the pairs of electrons coalesced into one large clump allowing them to move together without scattering, that is, without generating electrical resistance. By his own account, he had to scribble down the solution while he was on the train. 
in December of 57, the full explanation for the electron's behavior was published in the journal Physical Review with a simple title, The Theory of Superconductivity. During a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the paper in 2007, Dr. Schriefer described his insight with an analogy to a line of ice skaters arm in arm. If one skater hits a bump, he said, the skater is supported by all the other skaters moving along with him. Well, that's low temperature superconductivity. The holy grail would be to find high temperature superconductivity because it's not always easy to have some liquid nitrogen or some liquid helium hanging around to lower the temperatures of the materials. And scientists have actually discovered some high temperature superconductivity. Although high temperature is relative, the temperatures of these materials are still around negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The person who discovers room temperature superconductors, that person will have it made, trust me. The interesting thing about the theory between higher temperature superconductivity is the BCS theory doesn't work for that. So we're sort of back where we were 100 years ago, where all the top theorists, including Dr. Schriefer, looked for reasons and a theory for high temperature superconductivity and have yet to find it. It remains one of the mysteries of physics. Well, that's superconductivity. Let's talk a little bit about Dr. Schriefer. After he left the University of Illinois, he worked at the University of Birmingham in England and at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen before moving back to the University of Chicago and the University of Illinois. And then he took a faculty job at Penn in 1964. He stayed at Penn for 20 years. He collected the Nobel Prize while he was at Penn, even though it was for his work at University of Illinois. And then he moved to the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1984 as the director of the university's prestigious Institute for Theoretical Physics. In 1992, he moved to the National High Magnetic Laboratory at Florida State in Tallahassee, where he became the lab's chief scientist. In 2004, his life took a tragic turn. You know, some of our Nobel Prize winners have had tragic things befall them later in life. I'm thinking of Leon Letterman, who had to auction off his Nobel Prize to pay for his medical care, or David Thewlis, who developed Alzheimer's disease and didn't understand the prize when he won it. Dr. Schriefer's tragedy was a little different. As I said, it was in 2004 that he was driving from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, when his car, which was traveling at 100 miles an hour, apparently he liked very fast cars, slammed into a van, killed a man, and injured seven other people. Another one of the victims later died that may have been related to the accident itself. Dr. Schriefer's Florida driver's license was suspended. He pleaded no contest to felony manslaughter and apologized to the victims and their families but he was sentenced to two years in prison and he actually served one year in prison before he was released. So here you have a Nobel Prize winner who served time in prison. Florida State placed him on leave and he retired soon after that. What's interesting is after the accident, he never went back to physics, never contacted his old colleagues, never wrote any more papers. He sort of disappeared off the face of the scientific community. The last 10 years of his life, he pretty much stuck close to his own family. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. The story of Robert Schrieffer is one of the most interesting of any of the Nobel laureates that I've done because he was someone who could not go back to his scientific home anymore. So in tribute to Dr. Schrieffer, I picked out a song by the Shangri-Las and their great lead singer, Mary Weiss, You Can Never Go Home Anymore. <laughs> anymore and that's called sad